good evening, everyone. So uh, welcome to the uh, ACNS uh, webinar. So uh, today uh, we have um, we have uh, a speaker from Hong Kong and uh, Japan who will um, uh, introduce us. Um, firstly, um, may I introduce uh, 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 Professor uh, Professor Michael Lee, who will speak on the basics of interoperative monitoring of uh, for skull-based surgery, and also uh, Professor uh, Buenavi uh, Kumas, who will uh, who will uh, um, present on the topic of the minimally invasive uh, MVD. So uh, may I uh, may I uh, ask um, Professor uh, Tomasu Tufu to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Michael Lee. Hi, hi to everyone. Hello, it's... hello, Professor hello. Tomasu. Can you hear me? Nice to meet you here. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, you, thank you uh, for chairing our first uh, session. It's a pleasure for me to introduce this session because for this important topic, so we know uh, that intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring helps assess the integrity of a neural structure during surgical procedures, but not just during neurosurgical procedures. We know how is important these techniques in different kinds of specialties. Of course, for neurosurgeon, it's a kind of uh, must for some kind of technique. We have uh, uh, different modalities of intraoperative uh, neuromonitoring, of course, available like evocated potential, uh, electroencephalography, electromyography. And of course, and multimodality intraoperative monitoring is recommended as an effective way to avoid the permanent neurosurgical injury during surgical procedures. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, um, I will introduce Professor uh, Michael Lee that will, uh, so he can open uh, his talk. Um, Professor Michael Lee is a consultant and neurosurgeon and the Pamela Yude Nether Sologist and Hospital in Hong Kong. Uh, honorary Clinical Associate Professor at the Department of Surgery, Chinese University of Hong Kong. He graduated uh, from the University of Hong Kong in uh, 1994 and became a specialist in neurosurgery with specific uh, training in North America about stereotactic and functional, uh, functional neurosurgery. Uh, besides management of functional movement disorder and the pain disorder, Professor Lee is an expert in radio frequency and the deep, deep brain simulation uh, with other interests, including brain mapping, intraoperative monitoring, awake craniotomy, and the minimal invasive surgery. He is involved in cultivating a younger generation's interest in neuroscience by being the coordinator of Hong Kong Brain Day Competition. He is a tutor and trainer of medical students, interns, and the basic surgical training. He is also a trainer and examiner in neurosurgic and neurosurgery. In addition to being a trainer and um, in a training center coordinator in Hong Kong of the Advanced Stroke Life Support. He is currently the president of the Hong Kong Neurosurgical Society uh, and as well, the honorary treasurer of the Hong Kong Movement Disorder and the Council of Hong Kong Neuro Oncology Society. Last but not least, is the vice chairman of the Hong Kong Brain Foundation. So, please, uh, Professor Lee, so welcome. And uh, it was a pleasure to introduce your lecture today. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, I hope the lecture tonight will not, at least in the night time in Hong Kong, uh, will not bore most of you because my lecture is uh, basically for trainee. Uh, it's top, my topic is about the basic interoperative neural monitoring in skull base. So this is uh, my hospital, Pamela Yod, uh, Letheso Eastern Hospital. Uh, I have nothing to declare. So tonight, uh, my topic will be about interoperative monitoring. I'll talk about the history, introduction, uh, the stimulation parameters, electrodes, pitfalls, and pills, common types of uh, IOM, and uh, some case sharing. 
So we are close to Halloween. So uh, actually, uh, electrical brain stimulation began with uh, Aldini uh, in 1802. Uh, actually, because uh, he had some uh, stimulation experiment on the uh, frog's leg uh, muscle with uh, resulting in twitching of the legs. And uh, he go forward, he went forward to have uh, some simulation of the cadaver and uh, thought that that was uh, really a simulation on the brain. But actually I, uh, nowadays uh, people think that uh, he may be actually stimulating just muscles instead of the nervous tissue. But because of his uh, experiment on human cadaver uh, inspired a, a novel uh, came, uh, it's about the Frankenstein in 1818. And um, so uh, actually the first uh, documented electrical stimulation was uh, by, um, of, uh, of human brain was by uh, Sir Victor Horsley. And uh, I have to remove this, okay. And uh, uh, then came experiment by Sherrington and uh, William Keane, and then in Germany by uh, Fellow Kors, and then came our uh, Harvey Cushing uh, in 1909. But actually they were just stimulating the brain and uh, during the surgery. The real uh, interoperative monitoring actually starts with uh, Wilder Penfield. He started his uh, interoperative neurophysiological research in 1921. Uh, and uh, did actually the direct cortical recording and stimulation during surgery at NMI uh, in 1937. And then uh, uh, Professor Brown actually um, did uh, somatosensory evoke potential during his scoliosis operation in 1970s. And for large scale based tumor, um, the IOM came in uh, 1980s. And, um, and also George Oldman also began his uh, sophisticated electrical stimulation of the, um, in the cortical brain mapping. And then in 1990, the uh, American Society for Neurophysiological Monitoring was formed. So um, what is IOM and why we do IOM? So IOM is, um, we use it for detecting changes caused by insults. It can be mechanical, physical, or biochemical, such as uh, for brain retraction, you may have mechanical insults. Um, if you have change in temperature, uh, it may cause physical uh, uh, problems and uh, have uh, lost the IOM. And biochemical, we mean that uh, the, the tissue may be ischemic or maybe have some uh, acid-based problem then uh, you may also lose your IOM during the surgery. So that, that translates to uh, ischemic change in the nervous tissue. Uh, the second reason why we use IOM is to, we want to assess the function of specific parts of the nervous system continuously during the surgery. And um, it has become the, the nowadays the standard medical practice and uh, it's useful in surgical training, such as for human, as well as uh, in the AI, the robot trainee. So some of you uh, may ask why, why, why AI robot trainee can, can be trained with IOM. Actually, um, uh, we are now talking about the big data and uh, in some um, uh, advanced uh, neurosurgical center, we are collecting the, um, the uh, interoperative monitoring uh, together with the uh, robotic arm, uh, uh, the use of the force during the retraction or during maneuver, then we'll know that th whether this maneuver is harmful to the nervous system, and this can train, actually train the robot uh, in the long run. Of course, this is only the, the very beginning of this uh, project. And it also safeguards the quality of life of the patient because uh, all the nervous, eloquent, nervous uh, system are, are actually important for, for basic uh, activity disability living. So is there any evidence base for IOM? Uh, there is. 
for spinal surgery, actually it was recognized as uh, level A evidence uh, to uh, predict increased risk of adverse outcomes in paraparesis, paraplegia, and quadriplegia in spinal surgery. So if you are a master, um, you can just take a tumor out, like uh, in this big skull-based tumor, take a tum tumor out without any problem. However, if, if you are not, then probably you should take it out safely. So how can you take it out safely? Then probably you need a good alarm. Like uh, the laser here, if you can see the laser, you can avoid problem, of course. So this is our um, IOM panel, uh, basic IOM panel in my hospital. And uh, these two are my nurses who help me to uh, watch the uh, IOM and warn me during the surgery. So common types of IOM. So uh, there are few types like the spontaneous entity, like the EG, uh, EMG. We also have evoked response, that is the uh, stimulation uh, will, uh, of the nervous uh, pathway will cause some response. It can be sensory, such as the uh, visual evoked potential, auditory and somatosensory evoked potential, it can be a motor evoked potential. We also have a direct electrical stimulation of the nervous tissue. So uh, which type of test to be used and the size of recording and simulation should be, uh, should be uh, chosen wisely, case by case. So all you know, all this IOM, if you have uh, good microsurgical training, then uh, it is uh, the most important thing. Without this uh, microsurgery, uh, you will always have the alarm uh, during your surgery, it will be quite annoying, but it will be safe for the patient. So what do I mean by scale-based versus non-scale-based? Actually, uh, this time is quite new, uh, actually, but actually no, not many people mentioned about it. So scale-based, I mean that uh, there are many foramens, uh, for, foramen uh, over the scale base. So those are basically the cranial nerves and the uh, brainstem and the spinal cord. Actually, for Raymond Magnum is the largest for Raymond at the skull base. So uh, these are skull base uh, IOM. And for non skull base IOM, we mean the mostly uh, brain mapping, the wide better chat, um, such as the SLF, the AF, and the SMA. So I think this paper is very, um, uh, it's a good paper for the trainee to, to study. Uh, it talks about the, all the basics of the electric stimulation of the cranial nerves. So uh, let's talk about the stimulation first. So by applying an electrical stimulation, we can mean many things. So such as uh, we can mean that whether it's a monophasic waveform, monophasic is just a, maybe just a positive, and you have many type of Waveform can be a square wave, triangular, sinusoidal, uh, or some unknown waveform. And it can also be biphasic waveform with positive and the negative. And uh, because this area is the same as this area, so this is called a symmetric biphasic waveform. So if the area is different, then probably it's an asymmetric biphasic waveform. So defined in uh, mathematics, if you use the um, Y here and the Z, sorry, the C here, then if you have Y1 equal to Y2 and C1, C2, then this is called a symmetrical biphasic waveform. And we also have charge balance biphasic. That is the uh, area over this area and this area is the same then. Although the shape is a little bit different, it's not symmetrical, but it's still charge balance. And uh, monophasic is that the, the, the C2 is zero. That is only one polarity. And then uh, if we compress it and uh, it will become some burst pattern. This is a continuous burst pattern. This is maybe some intermittent burst and then uh, some period of rest. And uh, we, we also have some frequency, it's called burst frequency. And uh, 
we can also have some on off uh, pattern. So besides the waveform we mentioned, square wave, sinusoidal wave, or maybe irregular, this is called noise, okay? Uh, we can also have direct current waveforms. And for monophasic pulse, uh, usually we will uh, describe it in frequency and then monophasic pulse and then the pulse width and then the amplitude and then the bipolar, we use a four electrodes. Maybe this time we use four electrodes across which type of tissue. So this is how we usually report our stimulation. So it's quite complicated, but quite precise so that uh, others can follow and, uh, and replicate your result. So if you are talking about bursts, then you have to name the burst frequency how many pulses per burst. And uh, this time they use the electro array um, on the superior anterior tank. Okay, it's uh, gold plated and uh, the plate diameter. So it's very detailed. So um, in this paper, it also talks about all the connections of the cranial nerves. So um, for say for the olfactory, you know that uh, it can, go directly to the perform cortex, olfactory cortex, without uh, going through the thalamus. But actually olfactory nerve at another pathway that go through thalamus and go to the limbic area and then to the entorhinal cortex. So by this uh, diagram, you'll know that uh, most of the um, sensory goes through the thalamus with some uh, synapse here. And uh, um, actually uh, it's more complicated than uh, this uh, simplified diagram, but this serves uh, most of time. And uh, for stimulation, we, we haven't finished. Um, we also have something called charge density. So in uh, human, we know that the uh, recommend, recommended limit on the charge density is uh, 30 micro coulomb per square centimeter for um, macro stimulation electro in different stimulation. Actually, Shannon had an equation that defined the uh, boundary between the tissue damaging and non tissue damaging level of electrical stimulation. And um, however, most despite all this description, we know that. Uh, we are still uh, have some gaps in the knowledge of the electro material, electro geometry, simulation uh, waveform affecting the tissue damage. Also uh, for the uh, saline, the, uh, usually the electro is connected to the um, nervous tissue by saline and uh, the charge injection capacity, the electro surface morphology also plays a role, but uh, we have to study more. So this is a diagram uh, telling you that, oh, this is the uh, recommended uh, limit to charge density, 30 micro coulomb per uh, square centimeter. So this part of the curve, so this line actually is defined by the uh, equation that we just mentioned. So this is the non-damaging uh, charge density that we can uh, made with made with the uh, electrical stimulation, and this part is uh, we know that by studies that it will cause nervous damage. So what are these lines? These lines are actually um, uh, defined by the um, pattern of stimulation by a cord, a spinal cord stimulation and cortical surface stimulation and deep brain stimulation. So uh, you know there are many steps of uh, increasing the stimulation in this, um, say, in different stimulation. So, uh, so it's fo it follows along this uh, line over the safe zone, okay, and also below the uh, limits of charge density. So this is uh, how charge density affects the uh, stimulation. And tissue damage factor, we know that charge density plays role, charge per base, pulse frequency due to cycle, current density also uh, plays an important role. 
And uh, for say in different stimulation, you will have macro electrodes and micro electrode stimulation. And uh, because the um, limits of charge density was uh, calculated with the macro electrodes, so, so probably micro electrode charge density uh, could be different. So uh, we are not very sure about this. And um, the geometry and also the surface area are also important. And uh, okay, so there are still many unknowns. For current density, is uh, is different from charge density. Actually, uh, it had a near field. Uh, this this is the uh, stimulation electro. So near field, uh, you have uh, uh, closer to the uh, uh, source of stimulation and uh, more asymmetrical. For far field, you see that the, the charge would be more. Um, uh, symmetrical and uniform. Okay, so this is how, what, uh, what we mean by uh, charge, uh, current density. So it's different from charge density, okay. And we also have to mention about the uh, anode and cathode. So uh, common uh, mnemonics is acid. So anode current into device. But this current, we know that uh, it's a conventional current, it's not the, a flow of electron, not the flow of electron. Instead, it's a flow of positive charges. So it's, it's opposite to the flow of electron, which is uh, negatively charged. So um, this is how we define the anode and the, the cathode is the opposite of the anode. So we also have to mention some statistics before we go forward. So we have, you know that uh, for this two by two table, you have disease person, this is absent positive test and negative test. So we have two positive and two negative, okay. So by sensitivity, we means that uh, we concentrate on the uh, presence of disease, then how good we can pick up this uh, presence of disease. So this true positive over the uh, true positive plus false negative. So specificity, we mean that how good we can uh, say it's really negative without the disease. So it's true negative over the true negative plus positive. So we have one more to go. Uh, the uh, positive predictive value, it mainly focus on the characteristic of the test. So we are talking about the true positive uh, along this um, true positive plus false positive. And for negative predicting value, we, we are talking about the true negative over the denominator of the false negative plus true negative. So um, which parameter will be good for us to assess how good will be the IOM or other tests? So we know that the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value will be affected by the preference. Say for the preference, if this uh, decreased, so it's a, a very rare, uh, kind of disease or occurrence of uh, uh, something, then probably the true negative will be decreased. So the positive predictive value will be very low. So you can see that uh, this is just an example. If the preference is just 1%, the positive predictive value will be very low. And then the negative predictive value will be very high because the uh, chance of getting a true negative will be high. Okay, so most of the cases are, are actually uh, are negative. So uh, the negative predictive value will be very high. So if you are talking about the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value, you must um, ensure that uh, the occurrence of this uh, condition will be not so rare. Otherwise, it will be quite biased by the preference. Uh, so so we, we should not use the, so I prefer to use the sensitivity and the specificity. And now after talking about the characteristic of the uh, electrical stimulation, we talk about, we'll talk about other factors that will affect uh, IOM. IOM needs a very stable environment, say for, somatosensory evoked potential. Uh, we know that it can be affected by the temperature, by the um, change in blood pressure, change in O2 oxygen saturation, 
Um, halogenated inhalation agents can also affect the uh, somasensory evoke potential. Uh, actually, uh, TIFA, the uh, total intravenous uh, uh, anesthesia uh, protocol, say uh, if you use the pro propofol, uh, it can also affect the amplitude and the latency. So you have to maintain uh, a stable uh, uh, bis uh, uh, during the surgery. That is uh, not to change the uh, anesthetic agents too much during the surgery. And however, for the uh, somasensory evoke potential, muscle relaxants will, will have no uh, effect on the uh, amplitude and latency. But if you are using the, um, say measuring the EMG or the motor evoke potential then, then probably you, you should um, not use the muscle relaxant. Another uh, thing I would like to talk is that uh, air, air may be a friend or a foe. So uh, during the surgery, because it's talking about the electrical circuitry, so you need uh, um, a not too wet uh, field. Otherwise, the, the electrical circuit will have a soft circuit. Then you have, a, you have nothing uh, for your IOM. And uh, so air is quite good in this sense. But if uh, you have too much air, you, you drain all the CSF during your surgery, then the temperature of the nervous tissue will become the room temperature. That is around 20 degrees, which is qu quite low to obtain, um, for you to obtain a, a reasonable good uh, IOM signal. So you have a loss of temperature. So usually we'll keep the uh, nervous tissue moist with normal saline at uh, temperature of 38 using this uh, machine, okay? Try to maintain the water temperature. For the needles, um, we use some thermal needle, but you have a longer needle for uh, uh, the EMG response. And we also have cost screw electrodes for you to uh, screw the electrode to your scalp. And uh, it's very, um, uh, secure, but uh, sometimes it may cause some uh, bleeding in the scalp. And uh, it, it has an advantage that you can uh, you put that uh, quite close to your operative site so that you can uh, have the aseptic solution over the uh, electrodes without causing any problem. You will not also not uh, be loosened during in the middle of your surgery. And uh, if you want uh, less invasive, thing you can have adhesive electrodes and uh, however when it get wet uh, it will loosen so uh, also uh, it's also not as specific as a needle or cost screw electrode so let's start the case after talking all uh, about all this uh, basic stuff so let's start a real case so um, this is how we uh, figured uh, config the uh, uh, panel in my hospital. And uh, you have, after uh, you insert all those uh, electrodes to the right position, you create the montage. And you also define the uh, gain, the uh, filter, the low, low frequency, high frequency. You also can filter the, the um, uh, AC uh, frequency, like uh, in Hong Kong, uh, you have 50, 50 Hertz. Uh, uh, two, 220 volt, okay, 50 hertz. So you can uh, try to eliminate this noise uh, in your panel. And uh, you always check your impedance. If your impedance is not good, usually uh, there will be red in, uh, red color in your display. If it's all good, it, it will look green. So, um, okay. Uh, so this is about the uh, uh, case of uh, with uh, facial motor evoke potential monitoring. So this is the first um, reading that we obtained uh, after stimulation. So uh, do you think it's good or not? I think it's not good because there are many noises here. Um, we use uh, uh, a train of four with, uh, with four stimulus here. You can see the simulation. Simulation artifacts one, two, three, four, and you have 
other noise here. So this is not good. Probably the stimulation is too strong. So we try to tune it down, improve a little bit, but still lots of noise here. So we tune it down again. So this looks much better. You, you can see uh, after four simulation, uh, and then uh, all the tracing got some uh, response, actually. So we should use the lowest uh, stable response. So I, I'm still not very satisfied with this one because uh, in some machine, you, you will have this truncated off because of uh, some uh, setting within the machine, you have the uh, stimulation artifact truncated off. So if your waveform is too close to this uh, stimulation artifact, so in some machine, it will be missed by, uh, it will be um, ignored by your machine. So actually we should also adjust the scale so that uh, our true uh, important waveform are far less, uh, far, far away from this uh, simulation artifact. So I think this is, this is not good, okay? So this is uh, my first baseline and it become uh, blue as, a, as the baseline. So I'll usually repeat uh, at least one or two times with the stable waveform before I start the surgery. So uh, for motor evoked potential, it will cause uh, a tongue bite. Uh, so usually we will insert two bite blocks uh, to avoid uh, the patient uh, injured uh, his tongue. Okay, so this is um, no good. Why? Because the uh, wires are hanging everywhere. And this may catch uh, uh, some interference noise. So the better practice is to uh, organize your wire uh, nicely and uh, try to uh, uh, make it uh, good looking and uh, tidy. Uh, then you will try, uh, you'll have less uh, noise interference. So how should I uh, insert the electro? Actually, uh, we usually follow the international chain transit system. And uh, so this is the nose. Um, the nose, this is the back Indian, and this is your left ear, this is your right ear. So uh, by convention, we have all the um, numbers here, uh, the odd numbers over the left side and the, uh, and the uh, even number over the right side, okay? So um, C, okay, uh, let's start with P, FP first. FP means the prefrontal. F uh, means uh, frontal, T uh, temporal, P for parietal, and uh, O for occipital, okay? And um, uh, C for central, okay? And uh, in the middle row, you can see that, oh, uh, there is not a number or not even number, but Z. What, what do we mean by Z? Z actually means zero. Zero is the uh, middle. Midnight. Okay. So, um, and in the past, we don't have uh, um, too many colors uh, electro. We only have the blue and the red. Okay. Initially. So, uh, they define that the blue should be over the left side and the red should be over the right side. Uh, but nowadays, we have so many colors. We have the, all the rainbow colors and uh, black and white. So actually, uh, it doesn't anymore. Uh, it doesn't matter anymore. You can use any any color you like. Just just that uh, you have to label the electro carefully uh, because you have so many electrodes. It's quite easy to get lost. Okay. So this is a, another view of the um, ten twenty system from the side. Okay. So. Uh, why, why do I mean um, 1020? Actually, you measure the central part to the Indian, you divide that into 10, 20, 20, 20, 20, 10 is 100%. So uh, it's by measurement, okay? So 10% uh, uh, of the length here is your OC, okay? And uh, this line is all defined by 10% from uh, say A1, the, uh, the year. Okay, 
So um, I, I just want to point out that uh, you have the uh, C, CZ here, you have the central C here, you have parietal C here. So some of, some of, uh, some of us uh, may uh, mention about, oh, that this 20%, so how about 10%? So 10% we, we will say is uh, between 10, is the C, C and PC, so it's called CPC, okay. So, uh, so um, this is the central cell test. You can see that it's cross, uh, this line actually is not uh, in line with your, your numbers here, okay. So uh, um, it's a little bit in front of C3. So sometimes uh, we, if you want to stimulate on the motor cortex, so we will say, oh, this is C3 pi. This a little bit from the C3, okay? So uh, sometimes in the box, you will have this um, uh, labeling, okay? So uh, so you know that the primary co uh, motor cortex is in front of central focus, okay? So let's go to the uh, somen sensory evoke potential. It measures about the uh, uh, nervous function of the somen sensory pathway. Uh, it be begins with the stimulation uh, over the median or the outer nerve or the posterior tibial nerve. And uh, through the dorsal nerve roots, it enter the uh, ascending uh, sensory pathway uh, to the, uh, through the posterior column, uh, the uh, fasciculus, the great seal fasciculus and the uh, cuneate fasciculus. And then uh, go to the medulla and has synaptic connection at the nucleus uh, cuneus and nucleus uh, gristus. And then it cross and ascend in the uh, medial lamisco pathway to the ventral posterior thalamic nucleus, which in turn projects up to the uh, 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 sensory cortex. So the waveform, uh, uh, we have the uh, EPS point. This is uh, ipsilateral EPS point is uh, N9. So uh, we also have the uh, N13, uh, uh, P14. Those are originates from uh, dorsal horn and also the uh, caudate medial lamiscus. We also have the uh, N20 and P23. Oh, what do I mean by N? N means uh, negative, but actually negative is the, uh, is the uh, positive in the, uh, you know, diagram here. P is the actually, uh, N is the top of the curve and uh, P is actually uh, the bottom of the curve. This is by convention. Uh, I don't know why they always uh, mix up, but uh, uh, in the past, but it's by convention, N means the top and P uh, is the bottom, uh, okay? So so this, uh, this all uh, uh, some sensory uh, evoke potential depending on the uh, montage uh, you have different waveform and uh, and uh, different uh, the latency. Okay. So usually uh, for uh, for the uh, neurosurgical operation, we'll see uh, see the FC C three. Uh, this this I think this is the most uh, important and and commonly used uh, for neurosurgical operation. And for lower uh, extremities, we use FPC and CC. Uh, we use the C because you know that the leg uh, is uh, more medial, okay? So uh, for the hand, uh, you know that it's uh, more lateral compared with the leg in the uh, motor as well as the sensory uh, cortex. So, Actually, uh, you can see that all, all those waveform change will if you use different uh, montage. So we have to use a well-grounded circuitry, well-sheltered operation room, ideally. And the anode should be um, placed distal to the cathode. And we use constant current uh, stimulation because uh, sometimes there may be change in uh, conductivity. Uh, resistance so that uh, we use uh, it's best to use a constant current. 
And we use rectangular powers, uh, pulse width like this, and the hertz and the filter. And then we use the super maximal stimulation. Uh, it will not cause any harm to the nervous tissue, okay? Uh, compared with uh, the motor stimulation, uh, for sensory stimulation, you usually use uh, super maximal stimulation to have a better uh, waveform. So as I've mentioned uh, about the um, about the uh, montage, we have talked about this already. And uh, ah, averaging um, uh, by averaging uh, uh, the signal, we can uh, try to optimize the no uh, signal to noise ratio. So usually uh, in fifty averaging trials, we will see the uh, most of the waveform already. And the waveform looks uh, quite nice already. But if, if you have 100 or 200, then uh, usually all the noise will be uh, eliminated. Okay. So what do we mean by uh, significant change? Uh, every, for every IOM, we should mention about what do you mean by significant change? Uh, otherwise, there's uh, nothing to uh, compare, nothing to define. Uh, you cannot also predict anything without the definition of significant changes. So significant change usually means um, decreased amplitude by half or prolonged latency for uh, one millisecond or 10% from the baseline. So you, if you are using this um, as your definition of significant changes, then uh, you have the list of sensitivity and specificity. Uh, so this is a meta-analysis, 5,600 5, patients predicting the post-op neurologic deficit. So including all changes and re irreversible changes, uh, you have very good specificity, but you have variable sensitivity. Uh, uh, because uh, in some study, we, we don't know the preference, yet there may be also other uh, uh, factors affecting the surgery that may give you the false uh, positive. So, um, so this is quite variable, but if you are talking about the specificity, this is very good. And irreversible changes, the uh, diagnostic odds ratio is also very good. And if you are talking about total loss of SSCP, then it really signifies something that uh, the patient will have problems post-op, uh, will have post-op deficit. So now talk about another uh, IOM, it's called motor evoke potential. We have actually many types of motor evoke, evoke potential. We have transcranial electrical stimulation. Um, uh, before 1990s, the only way to assess the cortical spinal tract was a uh, wake up test for, for spinal surgery. But afterwards, we, since we uh, uh, tried to uh, use more and more transcranial electrical stimulation nowadays, we seldom use wake up test during our spinal surgery. Uh, however, we still use a, a wake cranotomy during our brain surgery, but that's another thing, okay? Um, besides the electrical stimulation, we, we also have the transcranial magnetic stimulation. And uh, uh, however, this is only useful in awake patient, but uh, it can be suppressed uh, with anesthesia. Uh, we also have the direct cortical stimulation that will uh, trigger motor evoke potential. We also have the uh, spinal cord stimulation. But now, uh, now this time uh, we'll just talk about the transcranial electrical stimulation. So um, using the 10 transit system, we know that uh, uh, for the limbs, we, we uh, should stimulate on the C1 and C2. And we use a, a nodal stimulation. Uh, we will check uh, the depolarization of the pyramidal neurons of the primary motor cortex due to vertical organization. So, uh, so uh, there's a preferential stimulation of the uh, corticospinal uh, uh, tract. And these are the typical parameters. So uh, for recording, we usually insert a needle uh, to our uh, um, special uh, uh, muscle uh, targets. 
So if we are very worrying about the uh, upper limb motor function, then we'll just insert the needles over the major muscles like the uh, biceps, uh, brachialis, or the APP. Uh, if you are talking about the hand movement, the fine hand uh, dexterity, uh, then we'll insert more uh, needles here. If we are worrying about the lower limb function, then we may have the uh, big muscle, the quadriceps, the hamstring, uh, anterior tibialis, gastronemias, abductor helices, etc. Okay. So it depends on the surgery. If you are very worrying about the limb function, you insert more needles here. But uh, I usually will, will insert at least a few uh, like the bicep or the quadriceps uh, over the other side of the limbs as your control. Because uh, if you have a uh, loss of uh, signal over the affected limb, you don't know that where it's real or not. But if you have needles over the uh, non-affecting limbs and uh, uh, they're present, then you know that there is a genuine uh, signal loss over the affected limb. So I always insert uh, needles over the normal side as my control. And uh, as I've said before, we use total intravenous anesthesia and uh, we cannot use uh, muscle relaxant after we intubate. During intubation, of course, you can uh, have some uh, short acting uh, muscle stimulation, uh, muscle relaxant, I mean. And uh, how, how do we know that uh, muscle relaxant effect has gone? We use this uh, train of four testing. So we give um, uh, four testing simulation. If we have three at least, then we are certain that uh, the muscle relaxant effect uh, has been gone. Um, for contraindication, of course, uh, if you uh, have muscular disease like uh, muscular dystrophy or myasthenic gravis, or if you have Botox injection done on the affected muscle, then probably you should not use this motor evoke potential. And also because you involve uh, a, a huge amount of stimulation, then you cannot uh, use this in the patients with this brain stimulator or cochlear implants or other stimulators uh, in situ. And uh, thumb biting is the most uh, common complication and this can be avoided using the bite block. And uh, for the significant change, we have four criteria. We can use all or nothing, that is complete loss. We can use 80% uh, amplitude decrement uh, or 50% decrease in amplitude and uh, for the threshold, uh, uh, say if you, you have to increase the simulation threshold by more than 100 volt or 20 milliamp, then probably uh, there's a significant change. Uh, another thing you can look at is the morphology. That is the change in pattern and the duration. So if you are talking about this uh, criteria, say in spinal surgery, if you are using the 80% decrease in amplitude, then you have 100% sensitivity and also 96% specificity. So these are very good uh, figure. And in Enrisimo, uh, in the paper, they use 70% uh, reduction in amplitude, uh, also very good sensitivity and specificity. And in posterior forces surgery, um, they combined the uh, testing of uh, motor evoke potential and the somosensory evoke potential. Uh, the criteria was uh, increased stimulation intensity by 20 milliamp and or 50% reduction in amplitude. Also very good in uh, sensitivity, uh, a little bit uh, worse in specificity, but still quite good, actually. So for cranial nerve seven and eight monitoring in Vasilibus for Loma, we only have uh, level three evidence. And for the um, Hearing, we have the BAEP, the brain cell multidisciplinary evoke potential. I think this is a genius uh, diagram. Uh, looking at the date of uh, publish of this paper is 1983. You know that uh, we don't have computer during uh, 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 in that uh, 1983, okay? So these are all hand drawing, but quite accurate, actually. 
Um, it says that uh, during the uh, uh, 10, milli 10 uh, milliseconds, and you have the uh, all the eight uh, waveforms. Okay, since since not all waveforms will will be there during uh, uh, every time you stimulate the uh, and try to uh, uh, obtain the BAEP dot. Not every time you can obtain all these uh, eight waves. So uh, uh, in 1985, they, they already know that there are eight waves. And actually they find all the generators, the, the neural generators of this wave uh, correctly, except that the pathway was a little bit uh, uh, skewed, okay? Uh, because uh, uh, Professor Wada from Japan actually uh, had a more sophisticated uh, test uh, on the BAEP in human and published in uh, uh, 2012 and saying that uh, actually all, all these are correct except that the uh, uh, lateral lemniscus probably have also the uh, ypsilateral uh, contribution. So uh, most of the diagram here is correct in 1983, okay. So this is very good. So um, stimulation, usually we'll do a quick stimulation with 100 decibel sound pressure level, which corresponds to a 60 to 70 decibel hearing level. So we have uh, to be very sure about the, uh, the uh, method of stimulation. And we also use the mask uh, uh, response using the white noise applied to the uh, contralateral ear. And uh, for the recording, we record at the word test as well as, well as the ear, uh, ypsilateral stimulation. And for, uh, uh, okay, this talk this talking about how many repetition, this is an uh, averaging of signal. In the old machine, uh, because it's old machine, they need to, uh, uh, 500 to 1,000 uh, repetition to have a good and stable signal. But for using newer machine, uh, say uh, you, you, you can have very good signal in 200 uh, to 400 um, trials. So actually you can improve your response time. That is, if you spot something wrong, you can uh, warn the surgeon earlier. So warning criteria, we have the um, uh, increase in latency of a wave uh, three and uh, four or five for more than 0.5 millisecond uh, and the decrease in amplitude by half. Okay. So in a pool studies uh, with 2,500 uh, MED cases, and we have this uh, BAEP loss of response, uh, oh, sorry. You have specificity uh, 98, very good. And you have the uh, uh, diagnostic odds ratio very high, okay. But uh, if you have significant change, uh, then probably is less uh, specific, but you have more sensitivity. Uh, using this criteria during this uh, pool study, the overall hearing loss was 2.2%. Uh, two, two so, this explains how you maximize the signal size. Of course, if you are closer to the electro recording, the electro is closer to the source, you can improve the signal size. You can maximize the signal to noise ratio per unit time. More averaging can remove noise, but it takes time. And if you have more rapid rate of stimulation, then you can get, uh, you can obtain the averaging uh, quicker, but uh, actually, the, the life is not so easy. If you have more rapid stimulation, the amplitude will decrease. So actually, the optimal rate of stimulation is de defined by this equation. So there's a limit to how uh, quick you stimulate. And uh, so, um, so this is a problem. So, so um, actually, uh, Professor Park from a Korean, uh, uh, actually uh, had a better hearing loss outcome. Uh, remember that uh, we just mentioned 2.2 in that pool uh, result. And this, uh, this time, if uh, Professor Park used this sliding scale protocol, warning protocol, uh, he can achieve a hearing loss of 
39%. So they use uh, uh, three steps. One is the uh, attention sign, that is the change in latency without change in amplitude. Then surgeons are notified, but no corrective maneuvers. Uh, if you have change in latency with change in amplitude, then it's called a warning sign, and the surgeons will be notified, and you have to take aggressive measures to try to see whether this change can be reversed. If it's just transient change, then probably uh, it will not cause any problem. Uh, if you have total loss of wave five, then it's critical sign, then it's uh, very bad, okay. So what are the false positive of BAEP? So probably the middle year can be filled with blood or CSF, which can affect your acoustic uh, impedance and also uh, a change in sound pressure. And this will change, this will de decrease the signal of the uh, evoked potential. So every time you do the surgery, remember to use the bone wax earlier on before you open up the dura or you cause any uh, significant breathing. Just use the bone wax to seal off all the muscle SL as soon as possible. Then you, you can avoid the middle year filled with blood or CSF. We can uh, change your BAEP. So uh, besides using the uh, uh, BAEP, we can also use direct electrical stimulation to help uh, in your CP angle tumor resection. So uh, we use you can use uh, facial nerve stimulation uh, using this minimal stimulation threshold upon two millisecond square wave constant current monopolar stimulation. So if you are using the uh, upon one milliamp, then the um, specificity and the sensitivity is not that good. But if you have uh, decrease the MST to 0 0.05 milliamp, then you have improved your specificity. And this correlates with good long-term long -term facial function. And if you are using the CMAP amplitude uh, less than 500 microvolt, then you have a uh, better sensitivity. And uh, this uh, correlates with poor short-term facial function. So uh, besides that, uh, we can also use the coconut action potential, CNAP monitoring. So uh, what, do, what, what is that uh, um, electrode is, looks like this. It's basically a wire with some uh, cotton wool thing that can uh, conduct the electricity. And uh, the stimulation parameters are here. And uh, you can place your... Um, so let's uh, orientate you first. So this is your cerebellum, and this is the uh, internal auditory uh, meatus. So this is your acoustic neuroma or vestibular schwannoma, uh, which is more correct, vestibular schwannoma. And then, um, so these are the lower cranial nerves, the 9, 10th, and the uh, uh, 11. And the, uh, for the seven and eight, we can't see it directly here. This is uh, most of the time uh, we can't see the uh, seven and eight. And uh, this is the uh, fifth nerve. And uh, well, probably the fifth nerve is more like this. And also the pituitary wing. Okay. Anyway, uh, it, it says that uh, if, uh, so uh, you can insert this electrode here to uh, try to record the cock nerve action potential, okay? You can insert your electrode here, here, trying to find where is it. So this is the uh, CNAP. Uh, so this is a BAEP. Okay, now we have the computers, of course. We can have this uh, waveform very easily uh, every time, uh, but still not all those uh, eight, uh, waves. We can also, we can only get the, uh, uh, the first to the fifth usually. And uh, for the uh, far field, uh, more far field waves, they are not so uh, stable. So, Professor Lee, we, we are a little bit over time. If we can go to the conclusion. 
Oh, really? So Thank, yeah, I but that's, that's a really to interesting about. topic. You know, I was just I didn't stop you for because that's that's important to okay. Uh, to know, Maybe you know. we can arrange another time, and uh, I can talk about it uh, more advanced uh, simulation. Actually, I have a video, a very interesting video that I should show you. Uh, anyway, uh, let's let's conclude uh, my talk and. Um, Okay, actually, I want to talk about the uh, uh, MVD, the, uh, 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 okay, uh, let's skip it. Okay, uh, so let's go to the conclusion. Uh, actually, I want to show you this special map first. Okay, since we, are talk we have talked about lots of uh, uh, acoustic neuroma, the vestibular neuroma, this is how we, uh, uh, my patient looks like, uh, and uh, for, uh, excision of this left facial uh, uh, acoustic neuroma, uh, we can achieve the uh, uh, 0 0.05 uh, milliamp uh, response, and uh, uh, the patient had no uh, neurological deficit. And uh, for this very big tumor, uh, we can only achieve a response to a 0 0.1 milliamp, and uh, it's really difficult to find the facial nerve during the surgery. But uh, we, we anyway we we uh, successfully. Uh, 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 preserve that uh, anatomically and physiologically. For some, also no facial uh, palsy and discharge home quickly. And uh, for this smaller tumor, uh, actually more compression on the brain stem, but more stuck to the brain stem, uh, it's still possible to do the IOM and then uh, preserve the facial nerve function. So this is another patient which is not so lucky, operated by others. Uh, uh, reasonable size uh, acoustic, but uh, only achieves a total removal. But we spot that uh, there are many insults around the tumor. And we uh, this patient was referred to me for radio surgery. And, uh, and uh, we, we, we asked the surgeon why there, there are so many uh, uh, insults there. Actually, this, this is a post-op film. Uh, this is a pre-op film. This is post-op, uh, lots of uh, blood product and also swelling there. And uh, they confessed that they didn't use any retraction, but actually no retraction had lots of retraction during the surgery by using all other uh, tools like the SACA, the bipolar. So those are actually causing much more harm to the uh, patient. And they also didn't use any IOM. So uh, that's why uh, it was, the damage was done to the patient. And uh, in summary, we talk about the history, the simulation parameters, the echoes, and the pitfalls and pearls. And uh, we also talk about different types of IOM. I only covered only part of this. Uh, um, I wish I have more time. Okay, so thank you very much. And welcome to Hong Kong. Uh, uh, we are now uh, opening up our uh, tourism. And uh, uh, let's see if you have uh, any planned trip to Hong Kong next year and uh, you can contact me, okay? So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lee. I, I didn't stop you, let's you continuing during the, 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 the part of the 10 minutes for the question, because this topic is really important and I, I think it, it needs uh, um, another meeting because now neurosurgeon, they have to know what, uh, what they can do, the potential of this tool. I can say most of us, I can say, we don't know uh, what's uh, the, what this kind of basic uh, of this technique needs to be known because you have to understand what's the limit is an important tool. We have to take care about the quality of life of our patient and the neuro monitoring is the only way to take care of quality of life of our patient. That in this era is a must. So I don't know if you want to add some comment, Professor Lee. I totally agree. Um, for skull-based surgery, I think uh, we can't have a weak craniotomy for skull-based surgery yet. So uh, there's no way, uh, there's, this is the only way to intraoperative monitoring. But if you are talking about non-skull-based, of course you have a weak craniotomy nowadays, then you can test with real time the nervous uh, function of the patient. So uh, for skull-based, I think this is the only way. And uh, for every trainee, I think uh, you have to try to uh, understand what's happening inside. And especially if you have uh, 
not too many cases in the center. If you want to um, safeguard the quality of life and also the quality of your surgery, and this is the best way, actually. You can learn from the uh, alarm that uh, whether, the, did, whether your move was too rough for the nervous tissue. So actually you can learn a lot, if you, especially if, if your center is not doing thousands of cases uh, every year. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lee. Uh, I think uh, we don't have time for questions, but we can uh, close this session and go through the, the other part of uh, our meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Th uh, thank you, Professor Tommaso, for chairing uh, this session. And uh, Professor Lee's lecture is uh, very uh, educational and uh, very important for us uh, uh, when we are performing the scalpel surgery to prevent the post-op biological deficits. So may I uh, move on to the next session? May I invite uh, Professor Yada to introduce our next speaker? Yeah, uh, greetings from India. Um, uh, I'll invite uh, uh, Professor Huminari Komatsu. He is a Japanese neurosurgeon. Uh, who has specialized in minimally invasive endoscopic uh, neurosurgery. Dr. Komatsu graduated from the School of Medicine, Tokai University, Japan in 1998. After finishing his residency training and PhD program from Fukuoka University, Japan, he started uh, doing endoscopic neurosurgery in 2005. Uh, to enhance his endoscopic technique, he uh, went to do the endoscopic anatomy training and develop endoscopic approach for the next generation at the center of anatomy, Medical University of Vienna, Austria. Uh, from 2009 to 2011, under Professor Manfred, uh, who is the world recognized legend in the field of endoscopic anatomy. After returning from Japan, Japan in uh, 2012, he served at the Tokai University uh, Hachikiji Hospital at Tokyo and pioneered novel endoscopic procedure based on his wide range of anatomical knowledge. When he visited uh, Kolkata, India for the International Conference in 2018, Professor Robinson Gupta, who is founder and chairman of Institute of Neurosciences at Kolkata, India, was impressed by his endoscopic neurosurgery. And he invited him to the Institute to help patients and to educate young neurosurgeons. In August, uh, 2018, he started to dedicate himself to the people with the brain disorder at the Institute of Neurosciences, Kolkata. Currently, he works at uh, Fujita Benten Hospital, Nagoya, Japan. Professor Fuminari, please. Thank you. Thank you for your kind introduction. I was especially glad to uh, study in India. I miss India. Uh, if possible, uh, I'd like to visit again. So, so let's start my uh, presentation. So today my topic is uh, pure endoscopic microvascular decompression for trigeminal neuralgia. So uh, successful microvascular decompression requires two elements, precise identification of a neurovascular conflict and the appropriate decompression. The endoscope provides panoramic views even in the deep surgical field with minimally invasiveness. Transposition technique is a desirable method for long-term outcome. So I will uh, introduce the, our uh, method of fully endoscopic microvascular decompression. The patient is placed in the back bench position. The three centimeter skin incision is made uh, just behind the ear and uh, 1.5 centimeter keyhole at the transverse uh, sigma junction is created. And the endoscope is fixed at the pneumatic endoscopic holder 
and the single shaft instrument are used for bimanual techniques. And uh, no brain retractor is used. Uh, continuous ABR monitoring is conducted. The decompression method uh, is usually a two method, the interposition and the transposition. And uh, we prefer to do the transposition method and uh, uh, we mobilize the offending vessel uh, from the cranial nerve as much as possible. And uh, the offending vessel is uh, fixed by fibrillin glue or sometimes the Teflon felt. Uh, first, I show the catabolic dissection of the trigeminal now through the endoscopic retrosigmoid approach. First, the endoscope proceed the uh, tentorial surface of the cerebellum. We can see the trigeminal nerve is here and the pterosal vein and third and fourth nerve as well. The on the third degree endoscope is then applied. We can see the uh, better uh, relationship. And this is the petrosal surface of the cerebellum. And uh, this is the trigeminal nerve. Also, we can see the six nerve and the vagular artery. And also the 30 degree endoscope, uh, the uh, mechanical cap is well visualized. So illustrative cases are shown. First case is the uh, 79 all the years, recited uh, uh, trigeminal neuralgia. The, the offending artery of this uh, case is the SCA. The 3D fusion image showed the offending vessel relationship of the uh, trigeminal nerve and the offending vessel. The video is shown here. That we can see the uh, trigeminal nerve and the SCA. This case, the SCA is easily mobilized and uh, fixed at the tentorium by fibrillin glue. This is very easy method. And we call this me uh, method as a one-step transposition. Now, this is the pre and the post surgical views. The complete decompression is conducted and the patient recovered immediately after the operation. The another case of the one step transposition, again, the SCA is the offending artery. The video is shown. And the uh, endoscope proceed to the trigeminal nerve. Uh, the SCA compressed, severely compressed the trigeminal nerve in this case. And the arachnoid membrane around the trigeminal nerve is opened. And then the, the SCA is mobilized toward the uh, cerebral tentorium. And uh, this, this offending artery is fixed just behind the uh, pterosal vein. Fibrillin glue is applied, and uh, this is the, the final view of the, this case. The complete uh, decompression is achieved. The pre and the post surgical view as shown here. The another case is also the trigeminal neuralgia caused by the SCA, but this case. In this case, the loop of the SCA is very deep. So in this case, uh, we perform the two-step transposition. The transposition method is different from the uh, one-step transposition. The video is shown. The, also, the, the trigeminal nerve is compressed by the SCA severely. And in this case, the ambient system is opened. And uh, this is the uh, peripheral, uh, distal part of the SCA. And this is, uh, distal part is uh, pulled out using uh, oxel bow. And then the loop became shallow. And then the easily, the SCA is easily mobilized. So 
after that, the uh, SA is uh, fixed at the uh, server of 10 total. This is called the uh, two step position, a uh, two step uh, transposition. Uh, pre and post search compute as shown here. Uh, this is reported in the international article. Also, the, the similar case, I think the, this is the, the SCA, the offending artery is SCA, the, and also rostral and the uh, caudal trunks compress the uh, trigeminal nerve severely. The video is shown. We can see the two branch of the SCA. Uh, in this case, also the ambient system is opened. And the oxygen ball is applied to mobilize the SCA. Yeah. By this step, the loop became shallow. We can see the motor root of the trigeminal now. And also causal branch of the SCA is uh, enrolled and then fixed at the uh, cerebral tentorium uh, with a uh, fibrillin glue. And then the uh, rostral trunk of the SCA is also uh, fixed at the same manner. The complete uh, transposition is achieved. Uh, this is the pre and the post surgical view. Uh, this is a also interesting case. The, the trigeminal nerve is compressed by the SCA, but uh, the trigeminal nerve is compressed at, in the Mechel cave. The video is shown. So now the, we can see the trigeminal nerve and also SCA. The arachnoid membrane around the trigeminal nerve is uh, sharply opened. So the roof of the SCA compressed the trigeminal nerve in the Meckel cave. The 30 degree endoscope is applied. The relationship is well uh, visualized. And uh, in this case, also the ambient system is opened. We can see the SCA behind the petrosal vein and the this part of the SCA is uh, uh, mobilized and fixed at the tentorium again. And also the near the Michael cave, the offending artery is uh, transposed and fixed at the dura. The decompression uh, is well performed, 30 degree endoscope will visualize the uh, situation. And this is the final explanation of this uh, surgery. The sad nerve is uh, PCA, the SCA is, uh, they are visible. Uh, also, this is the Mechel cave, transposed SCA and uh, Peter's vein. And this is the final view of the operation. Also, again, the pre and the post surgical views are shown. And uh, these are interesting cases anatomical obstruction. This is the right side, the uh, uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, and here the ICA obstruction was there. I showed the video. So endoscope is uh, introduced into the into dural space, but uh, this is the ICA. ICA is uh, well adhered to the petrosal dura, so it. Uh, uh, obstacle the corridor of the uh, endoscope surgery. So the dura was in size and separated. So the adhered ICA was uh, completely separated. And now we can see the uh, trigeminal now.
and uh, behind the trigeminal now, the offending artery is identified. Also, the arachnoid membrane around the trigeminal is uh, well dissected. And then the, this offending artery was again uh, fixed at the uh, cerebral tentorium uh, with fibrillin glue. So, all complete decompression is achieved. So, this is the, I think, the rare case that he had ICA uh, obstacle, the uh, surgical view. Uh, this and uh, another case that developed uh, uh, superior petrous vein obstruction. I'm sorry that this uh, case, the preoperative images are not available. The video is shown. So the uh, petrosa vein is well developed and uh, we cannot see the trigeminal nerve well, but uh, from the small space between the uh, petrosa dura and the petrosa vein, the neurovascular conflict was identified because of the, uh, thanks to the uh, endoscopic view. And then the Again, the ambient stand is opened and the distal part of the STA is mobilized. Again, check the situation, but the STA is still compressed the trigeminal nerve. So the STA is mobilized much more. And then the uh, fix at the uh, tentorium. Another part is also fixed uh, like this. And then the SC is completely separated from the trigeminal nerve. The space is very narrow. The uh, endoscope, well, but the uh, endoscope will visualize the uh, anatomical status of the around the trigeminal nerve. So this is the developed uh, uh, petrosa vein obstruction. So uh, this is also a rare case, a recurrent case of uh, right-sided uh, trigeminal neuralgia. The SCA was the uh, offending artery. I showed the first uh, operation. The uh, trigeminal nerve is compressed by the uh, SCA severely. So, and also the You can see the caudal side again. The, and for this case, again, the two-step transposition is applied. Uh, the loop is very deep. The transposition required two steps. The first step is the uh, mobilization of the distal part of the uh, SCA using the uh, size of wall and uh, the loop became shallow and then the uh, SCA is uh, fixed at the cerebral tentorium and complete de decompression is achieved. This is the end of the uh, first operation. But this patient uh, but this patient uh, had the trigeminal neurology again one year after the first operation. The uh, neuro imaging showed that uh, the SA is mobilized 
uh, it's cross, but uh, uh, we are not sure that compression is there or not. Again, the endoscopic surgery is performed. So endoscope proceeded to the trigeminal now. Adhesion was less. Uh, this is the trigeminal nerve, and the transpose SA is not mobilized from the uh, first surgery. It was fixed at the uh, cerebral tentorium well. However, this is the minor uh, petrosal vein. This, the, the adhesion between the trigeminal nerve and the petrosal vein was there. Because of that, the, uh, we identified this adhesion caused the uh, recurrence. So that's why the, this adhesion was uh, dissected sharply. And the uh, trigeminal nerve became completely free from uh, surrounding structures. After that, the patient uh, pain was relieved immediately. Uh, the right side is the uh, uh, post-operative view of the first operation. The right side is the uh, uh, finding of the second operation. And also this is the management of the venous bleeding from the superior petrous vein. The bleeding from the petrous vein happened. The, the bleeding is irrigated well. And then for the control of the venous bleeding, the sizer ball is applied. And the first ball is, must be applied behind the uh, petrosal vein. And then the a second ball must be applied in front of the uh, petrosal vein. So, so that the uh, petrosal vein is completely covered by the surge. After several minutes, the surge balls are removed. The hemostasis is already achieved. The petrosal vein is uh, reinforced. And uh, these are variant of ending arteries. The first uh, one is the uh, ICA, ICA common trunk. In this case, trigeminal nerve is compressed by the ICA pica common trunk from the caudal direction. The video is shown. So the, the ICA pica common trunk compressed the REZ of the trigeminal nerve from the caudal direction, as the neural image showed. The distal part of the, this artery is uh, immobilized from the space between the eight and nine, nine nerves and fixed at the petrosal dura like this. And then uh, complete decompression is achieved. Uh, pre and post surgical views are shown here. Uh, this is uh, also the Ica Pica common trunk. Also, SA is uh, offending artery. Multiple arteries are related. The video is shown. The SA and the uh, Ica Pica common trunks. The three vessels compress the trigeminal nerve. So the decompression started from the SCA 
SCA is uh, fixed at the cerebral tentorium. And then the, again, the uh, Ica Pica common trunk is mobilized from the space between the eight and nine knobs. And fix at the petrosal dura. And this is the uh, final view of the this surgery. Also, patient pain is relieved well. I think this is the last case. And, uh, this is the vertebral artery associated uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, MRI image showed that uh, uh, the trigeminal nerve is compressed by the ICA directly and the vertebral artery indirectly. Also, the SCA is uh, related to this case. The video is shown. Uh, we can identify the eye car and the vertebral artery. After mobilization of the eye car, the indentation is identified. So the decompression started from the vertebral artery. The vertebral artery is mobilized medially and fixed at the uh, petrosal dura. Also reinforced by the uh, small amount of the uh, teflon felt. And then ICA is uh, transpositioned and fixed at the petrosal dura. Then finally, the SCA is uh, again the fixed at the uh, tentorium. And this is the final view of this case. So pre and post surgical views are shown here. So advantage of the endoscopic microvascular decompression uh, is the endoscope MBD allowed the rival identification of the neurovascular conflict with minimal invasiveness. And also the endoscopic microvascular decompression with transposition is uh, technically feasible, as I showed. And using the fibrin glue is a simple and safe method for fixation of the, of the transpose arteries. So, and, but uh, uh, we don't have the long term outcome at this moment. So I think the endoscopic microvascular decompression with transposition is uh, expected to offer excellent long-term outcome. So, oh, thank you. Thank you for your attention. This is the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Komasu, for your uh, great uh, lecture and congratulations to your uh, operative uh, result. And uh, shall, I, uh, uh, shall I, in my comments from uh, Professor Yada and then um, uh, and then we open the floor for the discussion. Yeah, excellent, uh, Professor, uh, for excellent demonstration of the technique. Uh, I think um, before uh, any discussion, I'd like to ask a few questions for the sake of audience. Um, was there any case um, in which you could not transpose um, the vessel from the nerve, whether you require interposition technique in any of your case or no? Yeah, yes, yeah. there are some cases, especially the, in my opinion, the, many of the SCA, SCA can be transposed, but the, sometimes ICA uh, have uh, any trouble, trouble or problem. The, especially the perforator from the ICA uh, often go to the pons. In that case, we cannot transpose. That's the main reason of the uh, interposition, I think. Okay, so thank you. 
And the other question is, um, have you come across any intraneural vessel um, in, in, in your practice, any intraneural vessel, whether it was artery or a vein, sometime, although very rare, but if you come across uh -huh. intraneural vessel, means the vessel within the neural. Uh, ah, I see, I see. Then in that yes, case, yes, yes. What do you uh, yeah, I know, I know, I know the, uh, some report from others, but uh, unfortunately, I've never uh, had such cases. Hmm. Okay, so excellent. And um, did you come across uh, the dandy vein or petrosal vein? coming in a, your way or you have to, uh, you were forced to partially or completely sacrifice the dandy vein in uh, uh, your case or you could mobilize it. Yeah, yeah thank you, thank you very much. And uh, uh, basically I uh, preserve the petrosal vein as much as possible and I never sacrificed the petrosal vein so far. But uh, as I showed that uh, some bleeding sometimes happen. In that case, uh, uh, as I presented, the compression uh, hemostasis uh, is uh, useful. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think possibly the last question is, if you don't find any vessel, in case uh, in your exploration, you don't find any vessel, or you think the vessel is not a culprit, the vessel may be going parallel to the nerve, um, or either there is no vessel, or you you have a doubt that whether this vessel is, is the real cause of trigeminal neuralgia. In that case, do you go for any partial root sectioning when you don't come across in any of your case, or you, you don't? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, as you say that, uh, th yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, I think the very good question. I think, the, yeah, sometimes we encounter the uh, no offending vessel uh, during the operation. In that case, as you said, that uh, the, the mechanically, the fragile now is uh, manipulated. I mean, the, uh, we call the internal neurolysis, making a small incision around the direction of the uh fiber of the trigeminal now usually three or four incisions are made on the trigeminal now it's it's a uh useful method in such cases yeah or or sometime even the combing can be uh, yeah combing yeah it's also combing uh, yeah yeah the same i think the same meaning sir sir Excellent, mm -hmm. excellent, sir. I think um, uh, I think apart from that, uh, you have already covered everything. That all the vessels. It is not that uh, you uh, transpose a single vessel and then you should be satisfied. You should look around. There may be anterior vessel. There may be more than one vessel. So all vessels. And uh, we were told um, during our residency that most of the most of the uh, conflicting vessel is at the root entry zone, but you have uh, already shown that the vessel can be there at the Michael's cave also. So mm -hmm. you can have a funding vessel at the root entry zone. Uh, it is more likely if the vessel is there near the root entry zone, uh, because the, there we have a central myelin, which is more likely to get degenerated or demyelinated uh, but you can also have off offending vessel distally. So all vessels in relation should be decompressed and these may be mm -hmm. multiple vessels. Thank you, Professor. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Talk. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, and may I also invite uh, uh, Professor Michael Lee for your opinion on, uh, Komasu's, on Professor Komasu's the lecture and your view on the uh, endoscopic uh, MVD as well. Right. Um, congratulations, uh, Professor Comaso. Very excellent uh, endoscopic uh, approach. Uh, uh, have Have you um, operate also using endoscope uh, for the hemifacial spasm? Yeah. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, have I you think encountered? That... Uh, I mean, uh, have you encountered more 
um, a tactic uh, like the vertebral artery uh, compressing on the um, seven and eight bundle, uh, such that uh, your your uh, fibrin group may not be strong enough to mm. hold this uh, a tactic uh, vertebral arteries. Ah, oh, thank you very much. I think the important thing is the dissector arachnoid well is important. So uh, bit, uh, between the artery and the dura can be fixed well. But uh, in the case of the arachnoid, it's not fixed well. So, so the arachnoid dissection is important, I think. So, so if the arachnoid is well opened, in that case, I think the transposition is possible. Usually, usually. So can your endoscope go very low to the uh, lower cranial nerves and try to dissect uh, from just the, the lowest part of the uh, arteries using your endoscope? Uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, what do you mean? The lower cranial nerve, for example? Um, um, you have to transpose uh, those athletic vessel. So the best way is try to mobilize it from the uh, uh, intradural part, the, 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 the lowest part of the vessel, like uh, near the low cranial nerves. Near the low uh, cranial nerves. Yeah, so so you, actually can your endoscope uh, go uh, very low so that you can uh, easily mobilize those mm. adhesion from the lowest part of your vessels. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, also, the for the gross pharyngeal neuralgia, the it can be managed by endoscopic uh, uh, method. Mm. Uh, yeah, we can uh, yeah explore around there. Uh, another another question I would like to ask is that uh, uh, how how can you um, make sure that the lens are so clear because uh, some sometimes there may be some fogging, some uh, fog uh, uh, burying your vision, burying the, the endoscope. I'm sorry, the, what, what do you mean? There, um, are... there may be, usually the lens will be uh, uh, cooled down a little bit. And then when you insert your endoscope to the uh, operating field, there may be some fog uh, formation fog. over the lens. Fog. Fog. The obscure the visualization. The obscure, yeah, obscure ah, the ah, lens. Ah, okay, okay. How, how like can this. you ensure yeah. that? I, I lens... usually use the irrigation suction. The, you may saw that uh, during the petrosal vein breathing, the, I irrigated the uh, uh, surgical field. So the, that, that irrigation is available for the uh, clearance of the endoscopic chip. Okay. Yeah, so irrigated. The, yeah, endoscope is irrigated by the irrigation suction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah and sometimes um, the, the, I mean, uh, even the fume of um, the field itself may cause uh, blurring of your uh, field. So if you just put in a suction there in the field and take out that uh, humid air, then also the field gets clear. Uh, so excellent. I mean, you irrigate and then you suck the drop of uh, fluid from the tip of your endoscope and the things will become clear. Uh, another is small, uh, I mean, uh, for the resident and young neurosurgeon, if you find a tight brain, uh, during surgery, because that is what is essential. You have to have sufficient space to introduce your endoscope and the two instruments for bimanual dissection. So if you find a tight brain, especially in young patient, so what are your maneuvers to make the brain relax? Uh, yeah, do? yeah. as you said, uh, it's uh, uh, sometimes difficult. The, I think the uh, in such cases, I just slowly drain the CSF, and slowly, slowly, and just wait, and wait. And uh, after opening the arachnoid around the brain stem, the brain can be relaxed. So at the, until the, that time, the, the manipulation 
uh, goes uh, very slowly. Uh, that, that's the only method, I think. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Professor Tomasu, uh, can you share yeah, your opinion on Professor uh, uh, Tomasu's uh, lecture? Yeah, the uh, compliments for the um, for the lecture, uh, Professor Comasso. So there, uh, there's a interesting and and we know it's a, a beautiful uh, surgery. You know, MVD. Uh, it's clean. Sometimes it's fast. So and uh, has and amazing uh, results. So for a neurosurgeon, is something really that is is uh, always a pleasure. So just um, one one thing. I'd like to know, uh, do you think uh, for an endoscopic uh, procedure, do you, do you need some specific or dedicated instruments? Because on what can I see you using, you are using the, the microsurgery kit basically for this, or uh, you, do you think it could be better to have some dedicated instruments for the procedures, the endoscopic procedure? Yeah, the first, the, at first, we need to use to the endoscope holder. Good holder is required. Uh, without holder, I cannot do the surgery. And also the instrument, all the instrument I use is the single shaft instrument. Especially the scissors are important. The single shaft instrument, uh, recently it's available on the market. So I use uh, such instrument. Uh, just uh, another question. What what do you suggest for a younger surgeon or resident? So to start uh, with the endoscopic procedures, microsurgical procedures, what's your uh, advice for younger surgeon? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I think the first, uh, we need to practice uh, by Kadaba. As I showed that the uh, uh, beginning of the, my presentation, I did, I did under practice uh Kadaba first and then uh i learned how to use the uh instruments and the endoscope uh like that and also anatomy is around uh, I, I run the anatomy at the time so i think the Kadaba dissection is required for the endoscopic surgery first and then slowly we can start the clinical cases I have just um, just because uh, we have time, some, a couple of, a couple of questions for Professor Lee, just because we had no time before to discuss something. I'd like to know uh, what about uh, a wake craniotomy for uh, tumor in the or lesion in the speech area. So, is still uh, what do you think about the future of this kind of of technique for uh, monitoring of the speech uh, function? Well, uh, right now, I think uh, there's no reliable uh, monitoring for speech function uh, without doing this in a wet craniotomy because language is a complicated uh, function. You have all the uh, uh, ph phonetics, you have the semantic speech uh, testing during your wet craniotomy. And uh, it's also, Although sometimes that you may uh, read from the uh, paper that uh, there are many connectums now, connectum study nowadays, uh, talking about the white matter threads, uh, whether the language function really is relies on these uh, white matter threads. That's uh, we still need uh, more research on this. And uh, right now, I, I don't think there's any um, IOM with the patient in general anesthesia that we can uh, uh, quite uh, accurately predicting the post-op language deficit. So uh, I, I still do uh, a weak anatomy nowadays, uh, every time actually, but if I worry about the speech function. Thank you. And another question, just because when we have this tool we have to know if it's something appropriate or not appropriate for some surgery. So just some comment about the neuromonitoring for spinal surgery. Uh, it means like cervical spine, sometimes for myelopathy or lumbar spine. Do you think it's appropriate, the neuromonitoring in this kind of procedures, or is something sometimes 
it's too much we can say for these techniques. Well, as I have said, uh, if you are a master, you don't need anything to monitor. If you have done thousands of cases, you can just pull it, put in a screw with the watching the X-ray. I think, uh, so like in a, a major center in mainland China, they they done thousands of case cases and uh, they they don't need any monitoring. I think they are still safe. But for me, I'm not so uh, competent sometimes for uh, say a uh, uh, tumor or for a uh, very difficult degenerative spine scoliosis with uh, lots of turns, lots of uh, abnormal anatomy, then I think IOM is uh, mandatory. I think if you want to, to do the surgery safely, I will always do IOM in these uh, difficult cases. So it depends on your experience and also on the difficulty of your cases. So um, I will do it uh, every time, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comments, thank you. So uh, there are uh, several questions uh, uh, in the chat box uh, for uh, uh, Professor Komasu for your techniques on the MVD. So some of the questions were already answered during the discussion. So there are some questions that, uh, that I would like to ask. Uh, on behalf of the uh, participants. So the first question is, uh, is a fibing glue uh, law nothing? And do you always use the screw to stick the offending uh, vessels during your endoscope, uh, endoscopic surgery? And uh, the second question is about the, um, uh, how do you transpose and fix the dolicoatetic vertebral artery if, um, uh, if it's the offending vessel uh, during the MVD? The last question would be the incidence of uh, any any uh, experience with the postoperative meningitis uh, in uh, MBD. Professor Komasu. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. And uh, yeah, fibrillin glue. Uh, it. I I've never experienced the uh, the offending artery is moved after the operation. I mean, the fibrin glue is uh, uh, very reliable. Uh, the offending artery never uh, moved uh, from the fixation. I think the more than um, 200 cases, I think the, uh, I've never experienced. It's uh, reliable. And also the, the I mean, the uh, probably the dorico, yeah, ectatic vertebral artery. Yeah, it's also the transposed by the same uh, uh, technique. As I said, that the arachnoid dissection is the key, and also the attachment must be wrong, wrong, wrong distance uh, than as a small artery. It can be fixed on the petrosal dura. And finally, I think uh, I've never experienced the meningitis. After the operation, uh, maybe the fibrin glue mm, is not related. It's okay. okay. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. And uh, may I ask if there's any question from the floor? I think uh, the most important point which uh, Professor has made one is that you have to. Uh, uh, I mean, separate the arachnoid. So if you keep glue, um, I do not separate the arachnoid and just stick to the dura, adjoining dura, and then apply glue. Then possibly it may in a long term. But he is making it raw, and then it might be inviting the fibrosis later on. So, I mean, preparation of the vessel and making it naked. I mean, uh, removing the arachnoid over it is essential. And second thing is when you apply possibly glue there, um, you should uh, suck the CSF there so, so that it does not get uh, diluted in the CSF uh, in the subarachnoid space. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for support. Yeah, you are, uh, you are correct, I think. Well, uh... 
I have some supplement. Sometimes I, I encountered very calcified vessels and uh, I have difficulty to transpose it in a, and maintain it in a certain position because they are so stiff. Uh, for Professor uh, Kamasu's uh, vessels, they look very healthy. <laughs> and uh, sometimes in uh, uh, elderly, uh, they may have calcified mm -hmm. uh, quite hard and stiff vessels. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I tried a few times that uh, I use uh, Tenocom. It's uh, some sticky, uh, some sticky thing, at the uh, same use as your fibrin glue and try to stick it to the dura. And I have tried also use uh, one or two times using an Anderson clip to uh, clip mm -hmm. with um, sling of dura uh, or sling of fascia to uh, clip it to the dura to try to maintain the uh, calcified vessel in a certain place. But that, that only happened in one or two times. Those are very uh, uh, thick, tough calcified vessels. No, thank so you very much. Besides I'm, using fibrin glue, I'm, there are other tricks. Yeah, I've never experienced that, such a calcified uh, vessel, but uh, maybe uh, yeah, I think uh, also, I think these are very difficult cases, I think. Yeah. And also I use the sticky material, uh, as you said. Yeah, sometimes it is uh, useful and easy. Very easy for transport position. Hmm. So, uh, so if there is a, a, a if there is a, if there are any, a, no more comments, then uh, as may I thank you, uh, uh, Professor Tomasu and Professor Yada for chairing uh, this uh, session, and uh, it's very honored to have uh, two of them to help us to chair the. The webinar and also is a great honor to invite uh, Professor uh, Michael Lee and uh, Professor Komasu to speak in uh, into in today's uh, webinar and it's a very educational uh, webinar and we have uh, more than uh, uh, 350 uh, people who join us live uh, uh, all around the world and uh, thank you Professor uh, uh, Bin for broadcasting it uh, on the WeChat channel and uh, currently, we have more than uh, 180,000 views uh, on the WeChat channels. So uh, again, it's a very wonderful night. And I would like to uh, thank you all for joining uh, this uh, webinar.